Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the only show running the gamut of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running it live every Friday night. Hey guys, we're back here on the mats uh, with Eddie and Sean, and I think a question a lot of people have is, they both have very unique guard systems, the rubber guard and the Williams guard. They both rely on, on keeping the guy close, and I think uh, we'd like to know a little bit more about what differentiates them, what are the strong points, what are the weak points. So, with that being said, run with it, guys. I have a question. Yeah. Um, there's a position that uh, um, I learned from Jean-Jacques Machado, who learned from someone at Gracie Baja, that later became known as London. We just called it London. And it was a, it was a big part of the rubber guard. It was a big component. It was, it was very important. It was so important that we dug really deep with it. And I would start people in London, everybody, in class, we'd all start in London, and we would just we would start sparring sessions from there. You had to learn how to get out, and you learn you had to learn how to work from there. You know, progress. What's the next step? You got the control. What's the next step? Um, what ended up happening at my school, and I didn't I, I don't want this to happen. I wanted this to was uh, uh, I I saw, and maybe it's the way we were doing it or the way I was teaching it, but there was a such a glaring hole in it that I had to pull it out of the system. and never even made it to my first book because I was like, I had to make a decision. I'm like, man, because we would start, we would start here. London is, I don't know what you call it, but we'd be right here. Okay. We'd start right here. This, we would start. So what I learned really quick, and it's a great position because from here you can hit go-go sure. platas, you can get to almost platas. It's a great place, and you don't need that much flexibility to just go right here. Right. You don't need that much flexibility. But what ended up happening is this arm, being underneath here, it's kind of you're kind of trapping this arm here. You can't really pull it out if you needed to. Needed to. What ended up happening is my guys all started cartwheeling sure. over, right, right, right. so it wasn't enough time to pull out and block, and it became such a problem that I was feeling bad, like going shit. Now I'm too. Now they're all talking amongst themselves, going, oh shit, I just jump right over that shit. And it happened in an MMA fight too. One of my my students, Gerald Streben, who loved this. He this is he still goes with this. He still goes because most people don't even know that you can cartwheel over it. Most people just stay there and go, "Shit, I'm stuck. I'm gonna stack them. Should I should I posture up?" They don't know that they can cartwheel. So a lot of guys still in, in my system still use it. I stopped teaching because I just thought, man, because in my opinion, you gotta look, you gotta pretend that everybody knows the defense, everything, and and then assess it. So I wasn't too sure, so I just pulled it. And I'd like to know, I'm sure there's some way you could stop the- Yeah, 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 sure there, there are. are. Yeah, yeah, there's So you, you must have- you, Oh, like, yeah. And when we're talking about the-, yeah. the um, We're here, and what I'm talking about is you just circling all the way around. Right, right, right around like your that. head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, like exactly. so, well, right there. And that becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah. That became the main problem in our live rolling sessions. So, um, what exactly are you doing to stop that? Yeah, sure. That can go, I, I do two things. Okay. One is I do a low single leg finish. So we, you, you prop the guy up because when you run around the head, it's, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number one thing is that, well, I, I'm all, see, I'm not flexible like you, you know, mm -hmm. like I can't bring my foot. So I'm always on a little bit more on my side. Yeah. It's always the, the goal. But if you walk around my head and, and say I, the worst case, I kept my hands locked. So go ahead. Okay. So, so yeah. Okay. Uh huh. So worst case, yeah, see right here? Uh -huh. The worst case is I kept my hands locked until the very end, right? And when this knee lands, uh -huh. I'm gonna get a grip below your below your shin, uh -huh. and I'm gonna hit a low single. Oh, yeah. okay. And, and okay. almost- So the, you're allowing all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that's for a low single, yeah. Okay. I, I, I feel very comfortable when a low single finishes, so I feel like it's one of my strong points, actually. I, you know, oh, and, damn. and so when I thought, the guy, I thought, you were, I thought you were gonna stop that, but that's no, I, I like that to happen. It. Let it go. Yeah, I, I like that to go, and then I have a low single, and there's, nice. you know, there's a whole the, the whole sequence from low singles. You're either gonna cut the corner, you're gonna cut back this corner, or if they sprawl, then you're gonna lift the guy straight yeah. up. There's like a nice three series right there. Yeah, I mean that's another reason to get your wrestling down too. Yeah, 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 that's another thing we've been doing at Ten Planet too. I mean, you only have so much to train and. We've been, over the last eight years, been really, really focusing on what I feel is a deficiency in the MMA game. Sure. Is, is, is guard work, half guard, and just, we've been putting a lot of time on trying to, to improve the bottom game of MMA and, and make it so that it's a, 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 a very winnable 
position for you on your back. Because for some guys, it is a winnable position. There's a few guys out there. You got to look at those guys as the possibility, not as like the rare exceptions that have rare DNA from a, um, another planet. You know what I mean? You got to look at what everyone's doing. Like, the, you know, Shinya Yoke, I keep bringing them up. Everyone should be striving to have a guard as dangerous as Shinya Yoke. And with Sean as well. You're very, you're, what, what, what do you call that position? I could, yeah, they call it Williams guard. The, the, the London that you call oh, just the, you don't name every yeah. position like that. no I don't I don't have a name for every position yeah. because it's okay I think Dan Hurts called it the Williams card you know okay. I didn't name it that but they call it Williams card and then what you, what I do from Williams card is just go one plot arm lock triangle you know basic stuff I, okay. I, I, for me that's just a position that I get all the basic stuff out of you know and you can't punch from it right like the can't. guy You're that's stuck. the great thing you stuff that's the great thing and I, you see a couple people like over the last couple months I've seen a couple people go right to it. And again, my you know my old school students still go right to it. They're really comfortable yeah. going right there. Gerald Street, and he's one of my black belts. Ninety percent of the time, he's playing. Yeah. So, Sean, for the viewers at home that might not know how the finish exactly looks, can you guys run through that yeah, one more absolutely. time? Finish the single leg. Sure. So, I'm gonna have the position, and then and if I if he catches me with my hands locked, that's when that, that low single's gonna happen. So, he runs around. Go ahead, bud. And when the guy's knee, because you see how tight everything is, everything's pretty tight right here. I'm going after this. And the, the key on the low single is to get below the knee. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see my left hand. But the left hand is below the knee, it's on the shin. And I want my shoulder at his hip. So that when this elbow pulls in, my head comes up to the far hip, my shoulder's on the hip, and you got your three directions. You either cut behind the corner, you cut around the corner, or if he sprawls, you lift the guy straight up. You said you had one more technique yeah, to stop if, him from if doing I, it. If you stop it from, from reacting, you kind of showed on you yep. this one? Yeah. Same thing. If you, do, if you know that you're going to do the Uma Plata before, then I just cover your hip. Mm -hmm. And then if the guy cartwheels, I call this the seesaw. Look, that if, I, if, you, if you put your hand, if you flex your hand, like if I cover your hip, and when you jump, if I flex my hand up like this, like I'm waving, when your hip goes, it's like a teeter-totter. So all, all, all the weight's gonna be on my hands. It's, it's just gonna sit you right up on your elbow. Can I see just, that again? Yeah, oh, sweep nice. the knee out. So this one's when you have, you know you're gonna go on a plot and you go here. It's gotta be right at the hip line. See how, now I turn my hand, and then as he keeps walking, like, oh, you can't hold him up. Yeah. So it sits you up, and then this hand's gonna flip over, and lift his knee, and you get a nice little sweep. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. That position. Yeah. That's it. Those are my two two favorites when a guy walks around the head, and they work real well for me. So, what are you doing now if the guy doesn't try to walk around and doesn't? He's just trying to just be strong in the sure, sure. and have posture. I'll show you the whole thing. You guys want to see the whole thing? Yeah. It'll take me two seconds. It's not really complicated. It's not a complicated guy or anything. So, if it depends on if he's going inside control on this arm. So, if he goes to the bicep and going inside inside you. So, yep. Then I'm just gonna put the foot on the hip and, and arm lock this because there's no defense. Okay. Right? His his yeah. arm is stuck. His arm is yeah. His arm is stuck. If he pushes on the elbow, then you're gonna shake the knee in, and then you're gonna come into the oh, what wow. Danaher calls a clamp. You know, so you, yeah, I would let go at at this at this juncture when my knee's in, then you'd let go. You go to the clamp, you go um plata, triangle. Mm -hmm. You're on your side, so it's you have this all all of that. Then you have um plata. I mean there's a lot of it's just a lot of basic stuff you can do off of a off of an angle. What do you do if the guy is just sitting in there stalling? If I see I, the thing is, I want to get my angle. I, I don't lock it when I'm flat because I just don't. It doesn't. I can't. I can't. I'm not flexible like like Eddie, you know. So like I can't bring my foot to my nose. So it's hard for me to use the foot pressure to move your head away. So then I push and then I just keep getting your head to the side. So every time you drive in, like I can't get my frame. I'm gonna go to the other side. Or I'll just start playing basic guard. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't like. I don't sit there and hold it if, well, unless the guy's gonna punch me or something. Mm -hmm. You can use it to defend punches. But I, if you're just like chilling, then I gotta get a. I want to get an angle. If I can't get an angle, I'm playing a different guard. Right. Because I'm not just. I just can't pull my foot up over my face. You know. I did it once. How, I broke my see, knee in a tournament like that. Let's see you in a butterfly. Let's see how far away. Hey, that's pretty good. No, I'm, I mean really I'm good. fairly flexible, but. You know, like, that's not too bad at all. Can you do double lotus? Can you put both feet up like this? Yeah, no, oh, you actually can. You're pretty flexible. You're way more flexible than you think. Yeah. Very few people can do that. You're yeah. flexible. Yeah, I'm fairly and flexible. And you can always improve on it, too. Sure, sure, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what, what I ended up doing, see, I suck at wrestling, so 
for me to hit that single, it's something I would teach. Yeah. It's but good, like yeah. for me, I, my wrestling is, I wrestled two years in high school and I, I got one takedown in two years. I was, <laughs> I was terrible, I was terrible, seriously. Yeah, so okay. what we ended yeah. up doing, the steps were the basic steps, like you break a guy down here. Absolutely. You break, you break a guy down here and we prepare for the worst. He's defending properly, his hands aren't on the mat. It, it, like in your guard, that hand on the mat's huge. You just get yeah. right here, that's massive. You would never go over there if the hand no. wasn't on the mat. So. We assume that um, the hand's not on the mat. We practice two ways. Uh, uh, worst case scenario, we break a mess. So we have to control his posture here and try to work pummel. to get that hand on the mat. You could pummel through, I call this the zombie. Nice. Now it worked. So the next step was to get here. That was the next step. And then after this, this would be the next step. And then we go for an omoblata here. Or we go from here to here, and then I cross my ankles and just smash him here for a while before I decide. And depending on where his arm at, like his arms on the, on the inside there, right there, that, that's when I would go for this arm bar and then we switch our hips here. Um, same thing, it all depends where his hands are at. But what, we, what I ended up doing was like, man, the guys were cartwheeling over and we didn't have an answer for it. I mean, I was really rooting for this. I just didn't have an answer for that. So I thought, man, let's just, before it turns into something. Before you have to. Yeah, I, I didn't even think of like take, turning that into a single. I, I had no idea. But we ended up, in, instead of coming here, we eliminated that step and just, we control from here, which I call this chill dog because you have to be really patient here because when you're in this position, a lot of times the guy will just clamp, hug this yeah, into here, yeah, yeah. and then you're here and guys are like, I can't go anywhere from here, and then they give up. And my philosophy is like, if I'm, I'm not ever gonna give up this position. I'll stay here and inch my way through and I'll come through and then slowly, you know, if it takes two minutes, I'm not gonna give up on it. So that's why I called it chill dog. Just relax yeah. there. People were just giving up on it too much. So um, that's basically what, what all I ended up doing is just pulling that spot out, uh, pulling this out and just getting right to here. And instead, cause at this point for me, I thought my hands can do two things. It's hugging the knee, keeping this tight, keeping his posture controlled. Yeah, and if he decides to cartwheel, I could always block it, right. no hesitation. So it's doing two things here. And then when I transition here, it's, there's never a window here. Yeah. So we're here. And then from here, this position, I call Jew Claw, because the Brazilians didn't name it. I mean, you can call it Oma Plata uh, position, but it just came out, um, Jew Claw, J-I-U Claw, not the uh, other one. Um, <laughs> So, so from here, I play either parallel with them. I call this parallel Jew Claw, where you know, I'm trying to control them, trying to sit up, and trying to yank them back, and try to sit up for an omoplata. Or if that doesn't work, and he's got crazy posture, then I come back under here, hook, and then I push on the hips, and now I'm playing perpendicular Jew Claw, and I'm trying to hook his armpit, or even his leg, and try to control this here. Once I hook that armpit, and I can control this arm, it's over for him. There's really nothing he can do here. This is called the Hazlet because Dustin Hazlet did. He did it. Uh, he didn't control the wrist here. He just did this right here. He just to tandem tandem with Ori. Um, tandem could have unhooked there, so I I just added this just so that he yeah. can't unhook. So that would be the goal. And then we're this right the armpit and this is just control and this is the tap right here. Yeah. And it's hard for him to roll. So either I'm ta attacking. Uh, perpendicular or atta attacking here and you know um, the tighter your legs are the stronger your leg curls and the stronger you can squeeze your knees together and really ride him and control this is a very easy position to get into this is a lot of people don't like getting into because it's it's the battle it's, it's hard to control um, in the gi a lot of it, it's not necessary to clinch your legs together because you can grab the sleeve here and you're here and it's like really good control here but without the sleeve, man, you need your legs together. You need to control that wrist, and you're here. And you got to be able to, um, you got to be able to control his posture or dictate his escape. So if he tries to roll right over his shoulder, I'm always waiting for that. I'm always waiting. I'm always controlling his hips. So when he sits up and rolls, he's actually picking me up with him. And there's a couple couple ways he could escape. He can try to just goon out of it and limp arm and try to. A posture out of it, he'll make that decision quick depending on how, uh, uh, what kind of control I have on his arm. Um, if he really doesn't feel like he has the posture, 
He can roll like he just did forward over his right shoulder. And if I'm always controlling his hip and his body with my left leg, he's gonna bring me up. You just gotta be able to transition your legs outward and not in, which can work too. And you gotta stay tight here because if he's smart, he can pull that arm and now you're a cotton juke. So as you roll up, you gotta exaggerate this. And now we're inside control. Um, he could also, what a lot of wrestlers do, is they do duck unders where he can pull me back yeah. No, actually, throw me behind you. Like that one. Like you slip. There you go, that one. Throw it. And if you don't react right, it works great. So you need to train that reaction as well. And you need to be ready for that reaction. So when he says, right here, I'm nice and tight. And if I stay tight and I don't change anything, it's good for him. I'm supposed to be tight now. But if he is, manages to throw me and I stay tight, it's good for him. But if I go limp and spin towards his legs in midair right here, then we're inside control. It's gotta be perfect timing. So that's something that I train my students to perfect. Those, those instincts, when someone does the duck under, they just naturally turn uh, to the legs. As opposed to naturally, before you train yourself to turn to the legs, your natural reaction when he does the duck under is to turn towards the head, you're gonna lose it, he rolls up, and now you're here. Everyone wants to turn towards the head. So once you fix those mechanics and turn towards the legs without even thinking about it, he throws me, I just turn towards the legs and we're here. You know, it's like when someone goes under for deep half, that transition right into the capoeira, just get them, that needs to be seamless. You need to be able to go, as soon as you get to that point, deep half is a, um, a lot more dangerous for the guy to attempt. Once, you know, you, you understand the movement. Someone does something to you, you know, the perfect movement, it's in your DNA, the perfect counter. The counters have to be um, yes. automatic. Yeah. yeah, it's true. So um, that's, you know, for me, when I have someone in full guard, the key for me is to break them down and not even get to Jew Claw yet. Not even try there's Go-Go's and Hazlets. Let's, I like to break the guy down first. I'm in full guard and let's just say, let's say I broke him down and his hand was already on the mat. We're gonna keep it on the mat. I hug my knee. I got, I'm not gonna give him a second, a second to put that hand. No matter what transition, we break down. He, he waits for a second, I'm already here. I'm already hugging the knee before we, I'm sure you have those instincts oh, yeah, too. Yeah. Like, Cause if you wait a second, and then it's like, oh, you might not ever get that hand back on the mat. So there goes your whole game. So we're here, he's got a little posture. He lets me clear the neck. I like crossing my feet before we go to omoplatas or anything. I'm doing leg curls here. This is the invisible collar. This is where I want to be. This is the, the, for me, in my, in my guard, this is the, the best control here. There's absolutely nothing he could do from here. All the steps before, like if we go backwards, before we clear the neck and we're here, this is good control here. This is good control, but he can bust out. He can sit there and, um, you know, uh, the way you stop the rubber guards, you go in and you just, you just hold and squeeze and there's really nothing I can do after a while if you're just in there squeezing. If you can stall the rubber guard easily if you just don't want to do anything. But that's the beauty of it, is the way you stop it is you don't do anything. That's the, that's the ultimate defense then. Just the threat of the rubber guard makes it so that if the guy is in my guard and he tries to punch, immediately we're already getting in good positions. But if he gets in there and just holds and, and hooks my shoulders like this, like that, sometimes I can't do shit. And you're just standing there. And then you gotta go back, you gotta open up then eventually. You know, so um, in invisible collar, if we can get there, at this point, there's no, nothing he can do. He can't posture up, he can't back out, he can't stack me. I'm in total control here, there's nothing he can do. So he's at my mercy here. Some guys tap from here too. So I just wait here. And then once he's all broken and he hates us, then we go. Threaten with a go-go, threaten here, threaten here. Sit up, try to bring him back to the side here. Close it up there. He rolls, you, you um, dictate his escape. You tell him how fast he's gonna go. And then you end up in side control, hopefully. Good so that's just, that's just the, the basics of the rubber guard. But, and then there's um, other situations where you know, you're, you're not in full guard. You don't have the ability to play rubber guard. How do you transition into it? So I'm in a bad spot here. Let's say he's got head and arm here. Like, how am I gonna play rubber guard here? I have to escape my knee first. So if I can escape my knee, 
here. He's going to reach back and try to push the knee back down. And then at that point, I bring this up. And now we're playing rubber guard, but this leg's still trapped, which is fine. As long as we have the meat hook here, this stops the pass or minimizes the pass. And I could go for a triangle here. Or if I can't get the triangle, I could always go back to clearing the neck and we're here. So you're threatening with the triangle, but really what you're doing is you're stopping the pass because you're not in full guard yet. He can still stop that knee. So you better have this. Not only is, was my very first, uh, the very first component of rubber guard. This, this is all I used to do is this. I used to get in and just hold right here and try to get a triangle here. But if I couldn't get the triangle, you know, after a while they just stay clamped and you can't get your foot out. Then bam, you're already over here. Plan B is, is fine. You can go for go-go's or just transition here. Meanwhile, you can't get punched while you're in these positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but what ended up happening, my only triangle setup from rubber guard here ended up um, like a year ago, I learned that um, it stops the pass from half guard or minimize it. People can still bust through, but it, if I'm here and I can bring me hook in, this is hard for him to pass now because I got my shoulder right here. I can just stuff him. Yeah. <laughs> and then at any time I'm here and it's over. So the meat hook came back strong. It was the original, and then I st we started going to London, started doing that. I forgot about the meat hook, and I was just always going to London, always going to Williams Guard. And then, and this is how, this is my first introduction to Williams Guard was when Jean-Jacques fought Henzo in Abu Dhabi, or excuse me, when he grappled him. Some of you guys, <laughs> some of you guys get so yeah, mad, yeah, yeah. you get so mad. Um, anyways, and in that finals match, Henzo was in John Jock's guard and he just clamped on and John Jock couldn't do anything. So he came back and he said that, because Higgin was like hardcore, they were all hardcore Gracie Baja, but Higgin is the one that uh, was the encyclopedia for moves. Higgin is the one that partied more than all of them, but not enough, he didn't drink or anything like that, but Higgin liked to have a good time. He was single forever, he still might be single. Out of all the five brothers, Higgin was the one that wanted to go have fun the most. Everyone else was married. And he was also the one uh, who wanted to learn the most. He was like a little kid about techniques. He loved going to Gracie Bahan and showing him like the new shit that he got from teaching seminars around the world. He loved it. Him and Hodger Gracie were close. Hodger learned a lot from Higgin. They were tight. And uh, Higgin, like, I was a purple belt. And by that time, in the local LA Jiu Jitsu scene, People knew they were calling me the twister and all that stuff. Go, There's that purple little guy who's getting that wrestling move on everybody. So they started calling me the twister. I never changed it. To me, that was, that was a guillotine. Yeah. But they called it the twister because there was already a guillotine, you know? So I'm like, I thought the twister sounded goofy. <laughs> I remember telling, and when they started calling me twister, oh, here's twister, I'm like, ah. I go, nicknames are gonna stick. I asked John Jack, I go, okay, how do you say twister in like Portuguese? They call me that, the store nada. I go, call me that. And then never stopped. They never called me the tournament. It was just twister. And then it stuck and I liked it. So I like I rolled with it. But it's it's a trip that people actually think, even today, that I took a wrestling move and I thought I can get away with changing it and telling people that mm -hmm. I invented it. Right. Like how long would that last? How long would that <laughs> stick last? I would get smashed on in the martial arts world. But there's people that think that, yeah. You know, because they're smart people that are getting into jujitsu on a daily basis. They're really smart. They get into jujitsu. They don't really don't know about, much about the history. And then they hear about 10th Planet. And then they ask their instructor, what's up with 10th Planet? Is that any good? Go, dude, that guy fucking, he takes, you know that, you wrestled, right? He goes, you know that move, that the guillotine? That he fucking changed mm -hmm. it, bro. He wrote a book. <laughs> he called it the twist. And he goes, no! And they go, show him the book, show him the book. Look at this, look at that. Isn't that the fucking, it's really easy to take smart people, super rash, rational, logical, take those people and uh, paint me out as like some druggie who steals moves and uh, he stole this and he stole that and he changed the names. It's really easy to convince smart people of that. If they don't know really anything, you just show them the books, go that's fucking the guillotine dude, and you call it the twister, look at that. <laughs> and they don't know the story like, you know, I have to keep telling the story over and over. Like, it, it, can you imagine someone taking that full Nelson, 
incorporating incorporating it into jujitsu and calling it the fucking crazy neck slice. <laughs> How long will that fucking yeah, last? Yeah. And like him claiming that he made it up. Yeah. Like, dude, that's a fool Nelson. No, no, dude, I do it different, man. I do it on the sets. I do it different. I invented this shit. <laughs> that would be the craziest man in jujitsu. Yet people actually, without thinking too deeply, they actually think I did that. They actually think I took a wrestling move and claimed that I invented it. Now, you two guys are two of the most passionate people I know in the jiu-jitsu world, so I think it's cool that you guys are so focused. Oh, oh yeah, it's awesome, man. Yeah, man, I'm blessed. We're all yeah, blessed we to be able to teach people how to strangle for a living. Holy shit, Thank I did not expect any of this to happen. <laughs> for me, it was yeah. all music. I, was, I came to Hollywood to, to be a rock star. It was always about music. Jiu-jitsu was just a great fucking way to stay in shape. It was so much fun. I'm like, this is, oh, this, could this, is this really getting me in shape? It's so much fun. How is it getting me in yeah, shape? Yeah. I couldn't believe it. You know, but it was. Because I, and I got, a, I got so obsessed with it. And to me, I, I learned a lot from jiu-jitsu. And, and the main thing I learned from jiu-jitsu is, um, and this, this is going, this is like some ancient philosophy. This is nothing that I came up with. This is just, I just connected the dots and just, so he's saying it, he's saying it, they're saying it, they're saying it. It might be true. I didn't come up with this. But apparently the way the universe works, according to the mystics and ancient religions, is um, when you want something, you're telling the universe that you don't have it. And if you're telling them you don't have it, they're just saying you don't have it. Like you are a reflection of what you think you are. That's how the universe works. You're a reflection. I didn't make this up. And if you, you know, you could believe in Jesus and all that, that's fine too. It's the same thing. It just has different names. Jesus and God and, and Buddha and, and all that. It's all the same thing. They just have different names. But um, the, the music, something that I was never going to be satisfied. I told myself I will never be satisfied in life until I'm rocking the world musically. I thought that's what you were supposed to do. I thought that was the key to success. I thought that as soon as you were satisfied with your life, that, uh, uh, that you lose all your creative powers. That's what I thought it was. You can always stay hungry. There's a Twisted Sister song, Stay Hungry. I'm like That's what you have to do. You can never be satisfied, always want more. And that with, the, with music, that was always the mentality. Don't allow yourself to be happy until you get what you want. As soon as you start being happy, that's when you're gonna fall apart. That was the weakness. That's, I had it backwards. Meanwhile, I'm doing jujitsu, and there's no expectations whatsoever. I didn't like plan on like starting doing, you know, uh, starting my own association and having schools all over the place. Was, was, I thought maybe I might teach a class or a school in the long run, but it was all about music. Jujitsu was just, I'm gonna go train today. I know I only had two hours of sleep, but I don't care, I'm hungover. I just had to train jujitsu. It was just so much fun. I'm gonna be able to, I'm like learning to, to choke people and strangle people, shit. How come everybody isn't doing this? How come everybody isn't learning how to strangle people? You know, so it was no expectations. And then look what happened with the jujitsu. It blows up and I didn't even, it was all an accident, man. I never planned for any of that. I never, when, even when I had my first school, I never planned for affiliates. People were telling me I want an affiliate. I go, how do you do affiliates? Like, I don't know. How do you do that? I had to like look into like Krav Maga and take someone who was going to Krav Maga and this is how they do affiliates. I'm like, okay, uh, all right, you want to be an affiliate? I didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know what I mean? I let Brandon Quicken. You know what I mean? I didn't know what I was doing. I just, you know, people should show up and say, yeah, I'm a brown belt. I'm like, okay, you're a brown belt, all right. Just believe people and shit, you know? People are like, yeah, yeah, I'm a purple belt. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I learned a lot. <laughs> That's cool. So Eddie asked you a couple questions about the Williams card. Did you have any questions for Eddie? Uh, I, I mean, I saw, that's, uh, I just. What do you do when a guy stands up and backs out? What do you do, what do you like to do when, do you just uh, going off the umoplata well, and waiting down the shoulder or? Well, well from what position, from the juke claw position? When they no, we, in, the, in, in the, the, the very beginning, yeah. In the very beginning. If you beginning, get their hands on the un, floor. Until we get to invisible collar, there's windows. Right? Yeah. They can stall you out. They can, um, just like uh, Jay-Z and Shinya Yoki. Yeah. Jay-Z didn't, he, you know, I, you know, I was, that was the first fight where I was put right in the middle. Like, Shane Naoki's my boy. And, and then Jay-Z, they, they flew me. Like, Dan Lambert from American Top Team, he, you know, he was with Jay-Z. And, he, and we're good friends. And he wanted me to come out and show Jay-Z some stuff. And I'm like, damn, that's Shane I'm Like, right in the middle, like that. Like, fuck. So I went, and I showed Jay-Z how to stop it. And he stopped it. I said, just don't do anything. Just, just don't, don't punch. 
If you punt, he's waiting for you to punch. You better hope that one punch from the guard knocks him out. Otherwise, you just fall deeper. Now you can't get the hand back. Now the hand's trapped on the mat. Now, once the hand's trapped on the mat, you know, you could still get stacked. You're, you're, you're in New York now. Now you got to clear the neck. It's, you're looking better, but he can still do some shit. Once you cross the feet and you're an invisible call, that's where I, I'm trying to get there as fast as possible. Now I got you. Now there's a 90% chance that I'm going to progress from here. But be, the steps before that, there are chances for a dude to break out, depending on how big he is, how yeah, strong sure. he is, how sweaty he is, how good your clinch is, it all depends. I mean, you know, nothing works all the time. You so know? what if he's standing? I can what tell you, you I gotta bring your ass down. How do you, how do, you <laughs> like to do that? Oh man, that's a, that's a whole different, you know, when, when dudes are standing, I just want the foot. We're gonna start from the Drop foot. Drop into the foot. I mean, I gotta grab a foot and then I gotta drag you down. You know, it looks ugly. Show me, show me the best one. I mean, okay, so I grab his foot. And now, I mean, at this point, I'm just gonna just like try to tackle you or grab your legs here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come with, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna move you with this. Uh huh. You see this? I'm not just holding your ankle, I'm moving you with it. You know? You got, you, for me, you know, it's very, very important to have game from that foot. You got, that's like, okay, that's always the first goal. Unless the guy's just, if he just starts on his knees and he just gives it to me. You know, ultimately, guys are just running around. They don't want me to get, because I'm just looking for the foot. Mm -hmm. Then from the foot, I try to get the lockdown. And from the lockdown, either I transition to rubber guard or we transition to a, a lockdown sweep. You know, and use the butterfly to go back and forth between rubber guard and lockdown. Okay. You know, the reason, the reason I like the lockdown the most, uh, uh, as opposed to traditional half, is you have more control of your opponent's, your opponent, like right in traditional half here, I mean, he's not passing or anything, but you don't really have any control of this base. When I stick in the lockdown here, I have control. I can move him around here. Yeah. See this? Yeah. I like moving dudes around and controlling, coming this way, and then coming this way here. And then right here, I still have it in. I still have it in. I'm not gonna let it go. I still have it in. And then I pass at the end, you know, or I have lockdown. And then maybe he swings the leg all the way over. He swings the leg all the way over the other way. Yeah, no, no, brings a lot of guys who do that, but I'm here. It doesn't even matter, we'll come back. And I know I, I got the easy pass here. I know that when the leg comes over and I get on top, I have the pass if I want, but I usually go right after the legs here. Good so stuff. it's, and you know, when you look at, you look at the big foot against um, King Velasquez, this is, Bigfoot was exactly like this. He was going for um, the Brazilian electric chair, which my version has the lockdown in, and I'm here. This is where I want to be. Because even here, you're under control because of this. Yeah. If I had traditional half, you, you could just get back up. Mm -hmm. I got to put that back in. And then right here, I'm either going to, I'm going to check your flexibility. See how, if you don't, if you don't tap to that, then I keep this clinched. I get on the top or whatever, but. The way I set it up is I'm in here. This, I go from perfect double under, because you should probably have the wizard in. And then I'll be right here, hiding my face for MMA. And then I make the move here. But the way Bigfoot did it, it was, it's dangerous because he didn't have the lockdown and he went in like this and he got his face opened up with elbows. It's too open here. You gotta be here. So he doesn't know which way, maybe I come up here and wrestle him. Or maybe I come here. He doesn't know that my face is protected. And I have control of his legs here. You're starting to see more, more MMA fighters use the lockdown. You're starting to use it, but first, it's just like the rubber guard, it takes a lot of time to practice. And, and any style, anything you do, wrestling, striking, takes time. It's like wrestling. You want to do MMA. How many years of wrestling is it gonna take before you're taking dudes down in the UFC? Can you say, yeah, I've been working on wrestling two years, I'm gonna take down Ben Henderson. It's not gonna happen. You're not taking down Maynard, you're not taking down a kickboxer who's been doing MMA for eight years. Wrestlers can't even take those dudes down now. You know how hard it is to take a dude down now? It's standard now to have really good takedown defense. That's standard, Everyone has. everyone's hard to take down. When a dude is really easy to take down, it's like, ooh, how did he sneak through? That's old school days. Everybody kickboxed. My fighter, Connor Hume, wrestled his whole life. He fought KJ Newton, who didn't wrestle. He, he took him down in the beginning, but then the second and third round, 
you know, these guys are getting really good when all they're thinking about is takedown defense. So it takes a long time to learn wrestling. It takes a long time to learn striking. It takes a long time to add a new part of your grappling game. Now you have the grappling aspect, which has four dimensions. Wrestling, one dimension. Striking, basically one dimension. You know, jujitsu, shit. <laughs> There's so much. Yeah. There's so many different styles. Everybody at the top's got a whole different style. They got their own DVD with different shit. It's so different. How long is it gonna take to master these styles? You know, a rubber guard included. You know how much time you're gonna have to spend, like for, to master the rubber guard? You're gonna have to put rubber guard in workouts. So if you're an MMA fighter, you gotta wrestle, you gotta strike, you gotta drag logs up hills, you gotta fucking swim, you gotta sleep, you gotta eat. Yeah. They're not gonna put in an hour uh, every other day for rubber guard. They're not gonna do that. Or any kind of new shit. Like, everybody should be playing rubber guard in Williams guard. Yeah. Everybody. It's a clinching guard. It, it, it keeps you from getting hit. That should be standard, and it will be. It just takes time. Just like the striking, just all that shit we're talking about. How long did it take for us to figure out that the front snap kick works? <laughs> now Josh Thompson, he's throwing front snap yeah. kicks like all the time, and you got really worried about that shit. Because <laughs> now it's okay. We know now, oh, okay, that's another one we got to work on. You know, and then the turning side kick. Now, I mean, people were starting to do it before Joe, but now with the Joe GSP thing, everybody's practicing. My MMA fighters never done turning side kicks. They got you know, 10 minutes a day, they're just trying to get that turning side kick together. Very important. Even the wheel kick, when a guy's going one way, you could wheel kick, yeah. you know, it changes. So the same thing with Williams guard and rubber guard and all these new guards, like Spiral and De La Hiva. Right now, with the Spiral and De La Hiva, um, you don't see anybody doing that in MMA. Even the Brazilians don't even know uh, when to use it. The one spot that that's gonna be huge, Spiral and De La Hiva, is it already happened to one of my fighters, Matt Horwich. He fought Jake Rochelle, and in the second fight, Jake wrestled his whole life, and he's a national champion or something. He found a spot where to beat Matt. Matt on the ground's a fucking beast. Anybody rolls around with Matt Horwich, you're in fucking trouble. He choked out Tyler Sleepus and almost got him again in, the, in, their, in their rematch, but then got on a triangle. But uh, Matt Horwich is a serious threat on the ground. Serious. He's got the Marcella team down. You fucking leave your neck open, it's over. Quick. Um, so Jake Rochelle wanted to stand with him, obviously, but didn't want to stab too much because Matt Horwich got a fucking iron chin. It's very hard to hurt. And you know, he's coming at you with unorthodox strikes, but a after a while, Jake Rochelle said, you know what? He's throwing down. He's Matt Horwich can knock you out. He's knocked out a few people. He's got heavy hands. If he lands. So Rochelle would take him down, and then he would stay right here. He'd take him down, didn't want to engage, but he didn't want him standing up either. He's just gonna stay here and throw bombs like that, bam, bam. And he was right here. And Matt Horwich did not have an answer for him. We did not have an answer. That's when, man, after that fight, I'm like, you got to spiral. Right, yeah. You got the De La Heave or spiral. That's the way, the, I mean, if the guy's standing up, that's really all, it's how you're gonna pull any rubber guard or hat guard. You have to go under really lightning quick here. You know, and that's, where we're gonna see that style is that rare instance when the guy doesn't wanna stand with the guy, he doesn't wanna to go to the ground, but he takes him down and he's gonna win a decision. Hopefully one of these big bombs knock him out. You know what I mean? That's gonna come up. And it already has with Matt Horch. They know, no, that's the way to beat him. Right. So man, he just, his spiral on his deal, he was sick now. So we're, we're waiting for someone to, to do that on. That's all you're gonna do, otherwise what are you gonna do? You're just gonna be throw a couple up kicks, you know what I mean? I think those kicks, those up kicks, can be developed as well. You see, like, the way Hoist throws them, I don't know what his grandfather did or his dad did, but the way Hoist throws them, that's, there's some heat on those oh, that's kicks. Cool, man. Right? And even, even oh, like, you, like, yeah. Even like Halleck, when you watch Halleck, or one of, I think it was Halleck. Uh, and then, you know, Henzo, you know, he knocked out Jerry yeah. Bolander, right? Uh, Oleg. Oleg, Oleg, that's right. Who knocked out Jerry Bolander? That was five years ago. Bustamante. Bustamante, that's right, that's right. That's right. So even like the up kicks, oh, yeah. people were laughing at him. But you know what? If you really develop them, look at the guys who throw them with heat, you can develop that too. The problem is, again, time. You don't have time to do it unless it's proven, unless they say, okay, here's the new, the new technique you gotta learn, then you gotta add it. But no one's gonna add it until it's crystal clear and you see it. You know, and it wins a championship, and it's fucking Anderson Silva and Lyoto in the main event throwing that front snap kick. People are like, okay, it worked. 
And speaking of yeah. time, sorry, we're out of time today, guys. Uh, That's it. <laughs> Eddie, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you very much. Pleasure to be part of the group. It was Thank very you. nice yeah. to finally get to talk to yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. It's awesome. You know what I mean? It's really cool. I mean, um, I know there's been, uh, uh, there's quite a few guys that, uh, are we still videotaping? Yeah, we're just going to okay. close out here. Next Friday, we're going to be in Las Vegas for the IBJF uh, Vegas Open. So we won't have uh, this weekend BJJ next week. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks again for tuning in, guys, and keep on rolling. Yep. That concludes this installment of This Week in BJJ. Subscribe on iTunes, watch and review past episodes, and then be sure to join us again next Friday night right here for another live edition of This Week in BJJ.